When a viral outbreak or dangerous bacteria threatens human life, the CDC's disease detectives are often on the front lines. They go in prepared for anything because the diseases they study, like Ebola, Hantavirus, Marburg, monkeypox, and anthrax, are some of the deadliest on Earth. My name is Brian Ammon. I'm a disease ecologist with the Viral Special Pathogens Branch here at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. My job essentially is to, to go out um, into areas where an outbreak has occurred, capture animals, and test these animals for zoonotic viruses, specifically for the ones that have caused the outbreak. Probably the most notable are Ebola and Marburg, um, hantavirus, uh, and are some of the rain of viruses that occur here in the United States. Now I'm gonna tell you about some of the stuff that I take out into the field. This is a harp trap. Um, it's called a harp trap because it looks like a harp. Uh, you can see these fishing, this fishing line attached to the top and the bottom. Uh, but these are designed to catch bats um, and you can put them in front of caves or in flyaways and the bats will come and they'll hit these lines and they'll get caught in between here and it kind of messes with their flight and they sort of tumble down in to this catch bag down here where you can reach in and pull them out. We catch bats because we test them for diseases. We know they carry a variety of diseases, um, some of which cause very severe illnesses in humans. I have here a little GPS tracker. This tracker is designed to go onto the back of a bat, and what this will do is this will tell us where the bat goes at night. Now the reason we're doing this is because we think that the bats that have Marburg virus are going out and they're going into farmers' cultivated fruit crops. They like mangoes, they like bananas, um, they'll give it a little bite. If they don't like it, they drop it on the ground, and the next day or the next morning some child or some family pet comes along and eats that fruit and becomes infected with Marburg virus, uh, it could very easily start the next outbreak. So by knowing where these bats go at nighttime, we can actually essentially build a risk map. We can get the message out that, hey, don't pick fruit up off the ground. Um, uh, if it's been bitten, leave it alone. These are our powered air respirator filters. We like these because instead of wearing caving helmets with a half or a full face face shield, we can use these, but this is a helmet. It's very industrial. If you bang your head, you're not gonna fill it. It's extremely comfortable, but you just simply strap this on to your waist put that on your head and you're good to go. This bag right here, as you can see, it's kind of a backpack and it's designed actually to be a scuba diving bag. Now one of the first things that go on are snake chaps um, because when you're out walking around in the jungle, and I've done this many times, you, you tend to step closer or almost on uh, a lot of venomous snakes and these snake chaps are Kevlar lined so that if anything bites the outside of this, they won't go through and penetrate your pants and then your leg. These are the snake gaiters that we wear um, when we're hiking around in the jungle. Um, they're a lot shorter than the cave snake chaps that we wear, um, but these are much more comfortable to walk around in steamy hot jungles with. But they're pretty simple to put on. The, the snake chaps that we wear in the cave will actually extend all the way up past your hip because there's a good potential of walking past a rock ledge and having a snake come out and give you a strike in your leg. And this is... Uh, a half face respirator and the reason we use these instead of pappers out at the net is the pappers can tend to be pretty heavy and if you're walking uh, several kilometers between each net um, that can that can tire you, tire you out especially in the heat and the humidity of, of the rainforest. The way you put these on is you simply put it over your face like this and then hook it up and that provides a good seal and when you couple that with the face shield now you're talking practically the same kind of protection you would get out of a papper. One of the most important pieces of our personal protective equipment are these uh, gloves. They're turtle skin, New York City Department of Corrections gloves. They have a Kevlar lining and this gives us still some dexterity to take bats out of nets or to take them out of the caves but they're bite resistant so the bats can bite you with these gloves on and not go through. Now some of the things that we put in here that I don't have with me are, are uh, probably the most important is a bottle, a uh, spray bottle filled with microchem. And microchem is a viral cytal detergent that we use as a disinfectant. Every time we take a bat out of the net, um, we will spray ourselves off, uh, starting with our hands. We go all the way up our arms. We spray the face shield, everything, uh, including the gown, all the way down to our boots, uh, just on the off chance that if we did get something on us and we didn't notice it um, and it potentially has virus in it, that we hit it with this disinfectant and it kills any kind of virus so that we don't take it back to the vehicles, we don't accidentally touch it with our hands and put it in our mouth, 
Um, so everything gets sprayed off each and every time. I always take my own towel. In the, um, the more rural areas, towels are, are typically washed and then hung over bushes to dry. Uh, and during this drying process, there's a little fly called a tumbu fly or a mango fly that lays its eggs on the wet cloth. Uh, and once you put that egg on your body, it hatches and burrows into your skin. Now, if the towels aren't ironed, then the egg isn't destroyed and it stays on the towel until you use it on your body to dry off. Um, so I always take my own towels because I don't trust that people iron their towels. Last but not least, um, I always take this journal and I, I essentially write notes and letters home to my sons um, when I'm out there. I've got several years of, of outbreak responses and field research all written down in here for my boys to read uh, when they're old enough to understand and appreciate uh, what's been going on these past years when I've been leaving for three and four weeks at a time. We don't always have reliable cellular service. We don't have email contact and a lot of times um, it could be days before I get to speak with them and by me writing to them it makes me feel like I'm talking to them and it helps me deal with some of the homesickness that I experience when I leave my boys behind. Um, what I hope that they get out of it is, is a sense of adventure um, and, and knowing that their dad was at least out there trying to do something good for somebody somewhere. This is some of the equipment that I use out in the field. Uh, it helps me complete my work and it helps me complete it safely. Hi, I'm Ryan Wallace and I'm a veterinary epidemiologist with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And this is what I bring with me when I go into the field. When I go out, we're often called on responses to aggressive, potentially rabid animals and walk long distances to try to find them and the people they've bitten. And so we have to be able to carry everything with us on our backs to make sure that we can properly assess those animals and the people that are bitten. Rabies is a virus. It's the deadliest disease in the world, about a 99.9% .9 fatality rate if you were to get it. About 59,000 people every year do die from rabies. Most of the animals that bite people don't have rabies. Luckily here in the United States, rabies has been eliminated from our dog population, but we do still have to deal with it in numerous wildlife species. We sit in an office and wait for somebody to call us and say there is a rabid animal in their neighborhood. At that point, we have to have everything ready to go that we would possibly need to keep ourselves safe, capture that animal, assess it for rabies, and then um, be able to provide recommendations to the person who's exposed. So we'll start with the backpack. We have a throw net. Uh, like I said, these rabid dogs do not like to sit still. Sometimes they're running away from us. Sometimes they're running towards us. This net can be useful to try to restrain that animal so we can come up and um, give it a better assessment. We're out doing vaccination and we vaccinate an animal and we need to give it a mark so that we don't vaccinate it again tomorrow. Um, we'll sometimes use the squirt gun just to give it a little paint on the side. That way we know this animal's been vaccinated. If we do unfortunately have to euthanize or sedate an animal, these are our medications, our needles and our syringes. Dogs bite for all sorts of reasons. It's actually rarely due to rabies. It's because we got too close to it or we antagonized it um, over food. And for those instances, we can provide a chain to the owner and ask them to keep the dog chained up for 10 days. And if that animal's still healthy after 10 days, that means it didn't have rabies. That is what's in my backpack. When we go out and we train staff, we usually start with a dummy. Our dummy today is Seamus. Uh, I'm going to show you on Seamus how we use a few pieces of equipment. This is the catch pole. Easiest way to do it is to just put it in front of the animal with a little bit of food. They'll put their head in front of it and then you just slip it over. Slip it over like this and then lightly close it. If Seamus was really aggressive, our goal is to get her in a prone position and sedate it as soon as possible. In that case, we're going to put her down to the ground and one of our other veterinarians will come up and give an injection that'll put her to sleep and then we can safely assess her and the whole situation. These are absolutely critical to any rabies investigation. These are bite-proof gloves. I, I have had dogs hanging off of my hand, biting me up in the air. They can't get through these. If we can't get that close to the dog, maybe it's running away or it's very aggressive and we don't feel comfortable approaching it, we can use a blowgun. But here's our blowgun. The dart gets loaded into here and then you can shoot it out at this end from a safe distance. So normally it would be about 15 to 20 feet away. You would aim at the dog. And then that dart would have hit the dog right into the muscle, injecting the medication. And after a few minutes, we can come up and safely assess that animal 
try to decide if it has rabies or not. This equipment keeps me safe, keeps the animals safe, and allows us to take rabid animals out of the communities, thereby keeping all of the people safe as well. My name is Sarah Guagliardo, and I am a disease detective with the Division of High Consequence Pathogens and Pathology. A disease detective is uh, someone that spends their time trying to track down uh, different types of diseases. So what we're looking for is uh, patterns and behavior, and that could be related to food or water or even interaction with animals. A lot of the work that we do requires gear, so if you forget your gear for work, then you will not be able to complete the task. So now I'm going to show you a typical trunk that we use to transport field supplies and different types of gear. We can have up to 15 trunks in a single trip. Boots, classic tent, always helpful to bring with you because sometimes you're not sure where you're going to be sleeping. Uh, this is really cool. This is a um, UV based water filter. Um, you can take off the cover here, uh, make sure it's got its batteries in it, and you put it in dirty water and you push the button and a lamp comes on with UV light and the UV light will actually kill any kind of viruses or bacteria or protozoa that are in the water. So this is really neat. We also bring blood collection supplies, uh, tourniquets. They're very helpful for blood collection. Gloves that are um, you know, used for a variety of different purposes. So this is a cold box. We use this in the field to transport specimens. And the way it works is that you would actually have to freeze the entire box for a certain period of time for several hours and then once you're in the field, you place the specimens in here, and it's actually kept cold for up to 72 hours, which is really cool. I also have in here five different types of phones, uh, including a personal phone, a uh, CDC work phone, another type of CDC phone, which tends to get better reception. Also have a local phone. And lastly, we have a satellite phone. Um, and this thing is pretty cool. We also have the CDC medical kit. The medications you might find in here include antibiotics like Flagyl or Cipro. There are also anti-malarial pills in here that you have to take once a day. Iodine for sterilizing any kind of open wound and water purification tablets. So there are different types of personal protective equipment or PPE for different situations. So it depends on what activities you're doing. One example here is a Tyvek suit that I brought. Um, make sure you got it all the way around you. And then you want to zip it up. Also have a face shield, which is helpful to make sure that nothing is splashing in your face. And then of course gloves. And you're ready to get to work. Uh, I'm Clint Morgan, I'm a biologist with uh, the pox virus and rabies branch. Our field work looks a little different than some epidemiology field work. We're actually going and trapping animals and sampling them with the hopes that they may have some of these viruses that we're looking for. So monkeypox is a virus that's very closely related to smallpox. It can kill up to 10% of people who are infected with it. It was first recognized in the, in the 50s um, when it infected some monkeys, so then they named it monkeypox because it was first isolated from these, these monkeys. The virus is, usually comes from rodents, and so we need uh, certain traps to catch these animals, test them for the virus, and um, relay that information back to epidemiologists who deal with the outbreak response. Here, this is a cage style live trap. Let me open it up real quick. And uh, in Africa, this is good for um, squirrels or Gambian pouch rats, which are the animals that we think are the primary carriers of monkeypox virus. You open up the, the front. This little part here is called the trail, comes up and we put the bait in the back. Uh, hopefully the animal will walk in, going to get the bait, step on this door, and the front will close, and you have caught your animal. And here we have these uh, smaller live traps. You can go ahead and just pull one out for now. All right, and this, is, this kind of trap is perfect for smaller animals, like small rodents and shrews. They just run in the front, boom, and they're captured. This is rolled oats and peanut butter, when combined, is a really good a really good mixture uh, to attract most most rodents um, in any part of the world. 
Also uh, birdseed and even uh, some vanilla extract works well for rodents in the tropics. And so we actually use a machete a lot um, to cut through the forest undergrowth and stuff where we're set, trying to set out the traps. And another really important item uh, for biosafety and protecting yourself is a, a PAPR, which stands for Powered Air Purifying Respirator. So what, what it does, it sucks in the air through this filter in the front, it'll pump it up through this hose and into the mask which, which you'll be wearing. And so this hood will just go over your head like so. Yeah. And this way I'm breathing in the air um, that's being filtered. This paper is very important if there's some kind of biological contaminant in the area or you're doing um, direct uh, handling of infected samples or, or animals. I'm gonna take this off. And in this bag, we just have some uh, little things that we use when we're processing the animals. This is a, a spring scale. So when we need to take a weight of the animal, we just uh, use this little alligator clip, clip onto it, and it gives us, a, gives us a weight. And some alcohol pads, just some general items that we'd use for sample processing. And once we get all the samples we need, we, we need to store them. Uh, and that's where this comes in. This is a liquid nitrogen tank. It's a, referred to as a dry shipper. We charge this with liquid nitrogen a few days in advance before we go into the field and it's good for about two weeks afterwards. And so we pull this top off, and this is a, a nitrogen gas coming out. We actually use pantyhose, of all things, uh, because it can go down into liquid nitrogen and it's easily retrievable afterwards. It's just put our tubes and just drop it in. That way the samples are very cold and this little tab hangs out. Um, so once you collect blood from an animal, you set those tubes into this mini centrifuge and that will separate out the serum, which is a component of the blood, which will tell you whether it has been exposed to monkeypox or not. And what we're looking for is the presence of antibodies. And some of the places we go don't have electricity. And so a portable generator like this or something similar is very important to power the items that we have. So that's the gear that we use, uh, and we need every single part of it to accomplish our goal of going out into the field, capturing the animals, bringing those samples back to the lab, um, getting some more information about this virus, and ultimately save lives.